My name is Ben Sprung Kaiser. I'm the chair of the round. My preferred gender pronoun is he. I'd like to first, before we start, congratulate all teams for making it here to the round. <laughs> if you guys wouldn't mind going around, explaining your names and your preferred gender pronouns, starting from the Indian government. Uh, Kit speaking first, pronoun. Uh, just speaking second, pronoun she. Opening opposition. Uh, Andrew speaking first, he or they. I'm going to make the second feel right. Closing government. Ben, speaking first, today. Ready, speaking second, please. Closing opposition. Michael speaking first, preferred pronoun he. The Thomas he. Excellent. I call this house to order, and now call upon the Prime Minister. You're here. <laughs> What has not been achieved, leading to harms, leading to deaths, because of no other reason than an outdated constitution which is fetishised by a small proportion of that country and which is upheld by a group of unaccountable, undemocratic judges. We don't think that Supreme Courts should be able to strike down legislation and declare it as unconstitutional. In my speech, I'm going to be talking about four things. I'm going to be talking to you about how um, laws need to change um, regardless of what the Constitution says to re like reflect changes in social norms and practices. I'm going to be talking about how constitutional courts can prevent reform over um, important issues. And then I'll be talking about how constitutions are often very difficult to amend, even when a majority of people want to change that constitution, want to remove that block on certain reforms. Finally, I'll be talking about judges, why we think they're unaccountable. Okay, look, briefly just to clarify what we think the role of constitutional courts should be under our side of the house. Recognise that they can still declare that certain government practices are unconstitutional. We just think that if a law is passed by the legislature, it shouldn't be able to be blocked. So we are perfectly happy for the US Supreme Court to, be, to still be able to do things like uphold the Civil Rights Act and say that certain actions by the US federal government or by the police are illegal and are breaches of people's civil rights. So we think that that still happens under our side of the house. We just think that if the, the president signs, for instance, Obamacare, if the president signs gun control law, um, the Supreme Court should not be able to strike that down on the grounds that it voids the Constitution. Okay, let's get into my substantive. Why do you think the democratic mandate, um, unless it's a clarification, no. Um, right, why do you think the democratic mandate should override the ability of judges to strike down laws? Look, recognise that the reason that societies have laws is to um, reflect and like uphold certain social norms, certain social values and practices. But also recognise that these practices can change, that different people can attach different words and different values to certain issues depending on the time period that they live in. We think that constitutions necessarily shouldn't um, be able to prevent people from um, changing the laws on, in a society in which they live. We think that it's far preferable when voters are able to elect a legislature which can then alter the laws of their country to reflect changes in the values that they hold, to reflect changes in how they want the state and the law to, to act and to behave, to achieve the things that they want. Furthermore, recognise that a lot of voters while they do elect a legislature, while they do choose the groups of people who they want to make certain laws, they did not consent to the constitution, nor did they consent to the judges. Right? So we think it's wrong that we prevent voters from being able to make laws and change laws on the grounds of a constitution that they necessarily didn't vote for, but they might have had no choice in being able to choose. Furthermore, recognise that constitutions are frequently outdated, they are frequently inflexible. 
But it's not just the fact that they are old-fashioned and, rep and represent old-fashioned values, such as the United States Constitution, which was written um, by a lot, a lot of which still stands, which was written by people who viewed slaves as not human beings. I don't necessarily think that, they, that that Constitution carries any particular moral weight okay. compared to a democratically elected legislature. But also recognise that certain aspects in that Constitution are fetishised by groups in society unnecessarily, because they say the Constitution has this kind of mythical yes, divine status. We don't necessarily think it does. We think it's, it's, a, it's a code that reflected the social values of the people who were able to make laws at a particular time. We don't think it should tie the hands of future generations. How does it, this is the second point, tie the hands of future generations? Look, we think it makes it much harder for governments who are frequently yeah. elected to enact progressive reform. Reform to things like gun laws, reform to healthcare, reform to rights for women and gay people. It makes yeah. it much harder for governments to enact those reforms at the point at which legislation which can guarantee healthcare, legislation which is often the only way you can do things like restrict the spread of guns, can be blocked, uh, can be blocked and can be struck down by the Supreme Court. Yeah. Because not just does that legislation not get passed? There's also no need, no incentive for the other side um, in that political divide to, co to cooperate with you, to, to do anything. We think the, the immediate incentive for sides is to immediately resort to challenging the legitimacy of a, of a law via the Constitution rather than engage in democratic debate um, and, and, like, and engage with the principles of an issue. No, thank you. Look, we think that often, third point, like governments um, are, are elected by people who think that like practices enshrined in a constitution are wrong. Right? We think a majority of Americans, particularly after Sandy Hook, believe that the absolute prohibition on gun control, which can be viewed as like being part of the United States Constitution, is wrong and isn't what they want. But we think it's still very hard for governments to amend those constitutions to reflect the views of their electorate. Why? Because we often need a supermajority to amend that constitution. Right? So that takes a lot of time for governments, and it's also very hard to push that change through. We think often the only way that governments um, like can, um, can change the constitution is if they have an overwhelming majority rather than a simple majority. And we think that a simple majority carries just as much weight as a constitution which was written hundreds of years ago by a group of people who we don't feel have any particular moral validity. Final point before I'll take a POI. Yes. Yeah. Do you think that constitutions reflect public identity or that public identity reflects constitutions? Um, we, we think that like constitutions reflect um, like public identity at the time in which they were written. Right? So we think that the United States Constitution, large chunks of it reflect public identity. If we define like public as like the people who are able to write that constitution, i.e. rich white men. So we think that the United States Constitution represents the attitude of rich white men in the 1790s. We're not sure that that, necess that, that necessarily should tie the hands of poor black women in like the 21st century. Okay. Fourth point, why judges are often unaccountable or you prefer democratically elected representatives. First sub point of this, judges are often appointed for life, right? and they are often appointed on very politically biased ways. Recognise that the way in which you interpret constitutions can often change according to, politi to your political persuasion. That's why you have conservative and liberal judges on the United States Supreme Court. So we think the, we think the way that con the constitutional courts interpret those constitutions are inherently political rather than legal. That's why all the Republican judges always vote against things like gun control. Right? So we don't think the, the, the judges are necessarily very good, particularly as judges often come from a background which is unrepresentative from most people within that society. Right? They are often um, representatives of a rich white elite. Consequently, we think that clouds the way in which you interpret the law, in which you assign certain values and certain importances to elements within that constitution. Right? We think that it's much easier for disenfranchised poor, poor individuals to change laws via directly electing representatives rather than rely on a Supreme Court calculated by people who have no connection to them. Mr Speaker, we don't think the Supreme Court or the Constitution necessarily carry any more moral weight than democratically elected governments and we don't want to tie their hands. We're very proud to propose. Mr Speaker, the last speaker's speech essentially boils down to constitutions can be slow to change. 
and that sometimes does bad things. Given that my entire substantive is about how this anchoring process and slow change is exceptionally beneficial, we thought we like my substantive will directly rebut and take out that material. But firstly, one point of extraneous rebuttal, okay? <clears throat> I want to tell, um, like, he says that judges are entirely unaccountable. This is not true, okay? Judges can be impeached and taken off. We concede, or, like, we, we concede that, like, this requires a large majority. What we th say this is a good thing, because what we say is that this requires a large amount of public support, at, the point, at which point we, like, uh, you have to prove that this judge is long run against public opinion. Because public opinion sways a lot and changes, but identities tend not to. And people don't always act in the way that they want to. I have three points for you. Firstly, what are constitutions and why are they important? Second, what society, societal popu society's populations want in the long run? What they want and how constitutions like cement this? And thirdly, perverse political incentives and why these are solved by constitutions. Okay, so firstly, what are constitutions? So they are broad statements of values that are held within a society. Okay, we find that even in societies that do not have a codified constitution, they are often written through various documents, but also understood by all individuals within that society. Okay, why is this important? Because the identity of the populace is reflected within these documents. Okay, the framework of how we want to re of, of like how to react to uh, uh, events that happen within the world are in within these documents. These often hold cultural, symbolic significance and tradition. Being English and loving the Queen is something that is in our constitution. It is a part of our my identity. It is something that I feel an affinity for. This is exceptionally important to me. Okay? We think that, that, like, using their example of ownership of guns, we don't think on the Daily Show a British person going to Australia and talking about their gun reform and making jokes about ex-colonies with guns is enough to talk, uh, to have a reasoned discussion about identities and how those play out. Okay? The identity of the people in America, which is reflected in their constitution, is uh, like, which is reflected by their constitution is exceptionally important and whilst okay, like, this might not be as popular in North America and this identity has moved away, they cannot claim that in large parts of America, particularly the South, this is not a core identity that these people share and hold. Okay? That's why it's so important. So why then? Because what these guys essentially say is it's slow to change things and that's really bad. See um, like gun legislation. As I've already stated, we think this is something that is still key to the identity of vast swathes of the populace within the example. Okay? We think that like, what the, like, this slow changing process, if there is a long run shift in American identity, that then the interpretation of these seven, like, 300 year old documents will change. See how that happens with gay rights, okay? Because marriage is different, like, has a different connotation in the past than it does now. And with a long run shift in the identity and values of America, the Supreme Court upholds those, this new interpretation of values and strikes down legislation that would inhibit that identity that is so core. Cool. Why is it important though? Because this slowness stops the, sw the uh, back and forth sway of public opinion on certain issues. I'm going to take you to a time in 2001 after the 9-11 attacks. America, the American public is scared. It is told that it needs to defend itself. It needs to be strong. What the government starts to do is try and enact legislation that massively controls how America, what, like the freedoms within America. This is exceptionally damaging and against the will of the people, okay, in the long run. Because America wants to be free, it identifies itself as a country that has a lot of freedom and, like, is proud of that, okay? What we see, therefore, yeah, America, okay? <laughs> okay. What we see, therefore, is this is long run against the interests of the American populace. At the point at which the Supreme Court turns to the American uh, legislative body and says, you can't take away too many freedoms or we're just going to strike down the legislation, we think this is massively beneficial because the court has protected the rights of Americans. It has protected the identity of 
Americans. And this is popular within the American public in the long run. We have stopped gov the government from retracting the rights of Americans in a really pernicious and damaging way. Because what these good groups act as is a power check, a power creep check. Because governments tend to grant themselves more like rights, more power. Okay, note like like going through your emails in this example is a power creep. It says the government has, but the government's right to protect you is more important than your right to privacy. Okay, we think that governments are very unwilling to uh, like rail back themselves on these power creeps because once they have it, they say, oh well, we have it. That's our right as a government. I'll take closing. Closing. You know why? But look, we can still point out things that violated individuals' rights in court cases. Why is that enough? Because that's that, they're like pointing out that it might not be great in court cases is pointless unless you have the power to tear it down. And governments are often on like with oligop the og oligopolistic nature of governments means no party is going to run realistically on reducing governmental power in this area because this is important to the government to hold that power. At which point, like, no, neither the Republicans or the Democrats ran on, we're going to not search your emails so that terrorists can get away with you. Okay, that didn't happen. We think that that's it, like, that doesn't happen. That's why courts need this power. Thirdly, perverse political incentives. Because the way in which governments get into power is not often, often on like legislation that is, is based on this, okay? They're not often not discussed because of the shame of having these bad, like bad laws, okay? And a prime example of this is marital rape within the UK. The idea that you don't require the consent of your partner, of your wife, because she is your property, which occurred in England, okay? This gets struck down within the UK because courts, because governments are unwilling to take the step because they are not elected on this and they have to be uncontroversial. They have no incentive to do this, but a massive incentive not to do this. The fact that courts can take a long-run approach means that they are able to make these unpop short run um, unpopular like in terms of voting decisions, but not in terms of like, actually giving people what they want decisions. I'm exceptionally proud to oppose this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution of Chile was written by a fascist government who in no way can be said to represent the identity, the culture of the current people of Chile. We do not think it's the case that necessarily constitutions do have to reflect the views of the people. We think that what we've been saying on our side of the house is purely the fact that the fact that they are unable to change to like changing social norms, changing social attitudes, changing social values means that it is incredibly harmful for the populace of that country when, when we cannot pass legislation that is otherwise deemed unconstitutional. I'm going to bring you two main points today. Firstly, I'm going to talk about what happens at the moment when the judiciary strikes down elections. Why most of their stuff about this producing some kind of check on government power is actually like falls on our side of the house. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about the way in which laws are interpreted and why it's necessarily unrepresentative when it is done by a Supreme Court. So firstly, in terms of some like extraneous rebuttal, it doesn't necessarily fit into that. There's stuff about like 9-11 and, and about how it, the, the constitutions necessarily reflect the identity of a populace and governments shouldn't be able to go against that, we don't think actually stands. Why? Because we think that governments do have to an extent reflect the extent to which the constitution does reflect things that people do really believe. They're not going to pass incredibly unpopular legislation because they are a democratically elected government and that, that would be political suicide. However, we think governments are free to realise where the majority of the populace does not think that the constitution represents them and, and, and elects them on the basis that they are able to pass laws 
um, that will actually affect, um, change the constitution in a way that does reflect them, okay? So we don't think it's the case that governments suddenly stand up and just decide to like, massively reinterpret all the laws and completely demolish the identities of the people. Now, moving on to my main point of standard, because everything else that these guys said, in terms of stuff about impeachment, in terms of stuff about checks on government power, actually falls on our side, okay? Because if they, these governments are so desperate to change like, legislation to affect um, the, the way the country is run in order to consolidate their power in the way that these guys want to characterise them as being so desperate to do, we think that what you see is an incentive for these politicians, when they try and pass legislation and get struck down, to massively neuter the court, okay? We then Viktor Orban, when the, uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, when he saw that he was unable to get legislation passed through the government, massively neutered the judiciary by like, minimize, like, lowering the minimum and ma mandatory retirement age from 68 to 60, literally like firing half the judiciary so he could appoint who he wanted to, so he could pass whatever legislation he wanted to. We think this is massively damaging insofar as it hugely affects the way in which the, um, the, the, the government is able to control the process of legislation. We think this reduces all the really useful powers we retain on our side of the house insofar as we still allow for the practices to be declared unconstitutional to check the government's power in that way. We think that the reason this is so easy, this, this actually can happen in cases where governments are so desperate to pass legislation and find it blocked is because by doing that, the populace themselves do massively support any actions that can be done to pass that legislation if they populists are the people who massively support it. So we think it's really, really harmful when the government is able to appeal to the people and say, look, these guys are getting in the way of what you guys want. I should be able to do this, new to the court in this way, so that you guys can, so I can do my job better. We think that kind of rhetoric is only possible on their side of the house, where it is possible for these courts to strike down legislation, to say it is unconstitutional. So we think that that is hugely harmful insofar as it results in two main things. Firstly, we get a loss of the separation of power, yeah? We get more of the, like, a judiciary, like, invested in the executive, in the legislature, in, like, in countries with constitutional courts. We think that's just massively harmful insofar as it consolidates the power base that these guys want to talk about. It makes it really, really difficult for countries to exist with a check and balance system that ensures that one part of the, like, system doesn't get too much power. We also think it actually massively damages the ability to protect minority rights, to protect, like, civil rights within these countries because uh, uh, for, for the reasons I just said before yeah because it is much e harder to like for, for a, there to be a check on the power of the government when it comes to deciding that they want to enact a particular policy that might be against the rights of the people because now the, the, the judiciary is less able to say that practice doing that is unconstitutional that should not happen no. so we think that's hugely harmful on our side of the house I'll take a rebuttal from closing actually because I promised my I'd given one like a week ago so are most of the political issues that you're talking about solved by sensible appointment procedures to Supreme Court? Why are these sorts of things inherent to the very construction and nature of the Supreme or Constitutional Court that has these powers? So, say that one more time. So, are most of the politicisation problems you're talking about with appointment procedures to these bodies rather than an inherent problem with them having the authorities that you are so decrying? So in terms of the appointment procedures, we think it is the case that those things are not things that can be easily changed, yeah? We think that, firstly, I think this is a bit of a distraction for you, I'm only going to briefly deal with it, but we think that for the most part, like, appointment procedures are seen as being done on the basis of prestige, on the basis of the ability to practice the law. We think for those reasons it's very hard to say that we should democratically elect the Supreme Court. We don't think that works in that way, we do, so we don't think that, that stands. So in terms of my second point about how this changes, how, the way in which we interpret the law and why it's necessarily unreflective to have a Supreme Court that is able to strike down laws oh, in this way. Because we think that in the sense that laws are, like the Constitution, the way in which we read the Constitution very much depends on our, the, the way in which we have been brought up. Yeah, the way, the cultural values that we were instilled with, the ways in which we were, we recognise certain aspects of the law as more important than others. Okay, and these guys want to talk about national that as well, yeah? Because the significance of certain parts of that legislation are necessarily appear to me because of the way I've been brought up, because of where I was born, because of who I am. We think that insofar as democratically elected representatives are able to tell the people how they basically value certain aspects of laws, certain aspects of society, we think that means they are necessarily going to be more representative when it comes to doing things like passing legislation that might be against certain parts of the constitution or favour certain parts of that constitution.
over other parts. We think that necessarily that means that the laws that they pass are going to be more representative in terms of like be, being able to be followed by that populace. We think that Supreme Court judges do not exist in that kind of sphere. We think instead they exist in a situation where they are they are appointed by a president and then ratified by the, like, by, um, I can't remember what part of Congress, uh, maybe both, uh, in, in America. And we think for those re we think that, that in that sense, it is not necessarily the case that the people get a direct say in exactly how their laws are being interpreted and exactly how their, their, their legislation that they have to follow is being practiced. So we think for these reasons, it is always going to be the case that these individuals will be rep unrepresentative. We think that's massively harmful insofar as we deserve to live in the, under the kind of laws that we ourselves consent into. And for those reasons we beg you to oppose. Thanks. I think the Deputy Prime Minister for that speech now call upon the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Here we go. Mr. Speaker, what we bring you is a case that courts, so that governments don't always get it right, and frankly, that the people don't always get it right. Andy gives you a number of examples of the negative short-term incentives and situations <coughs> that can lead the people to do things that they regret in the long term, and that the, of the protections that the system of supreme legis and constitutional courts offer to the people. What I'm going to do is build on this in three ways. I'm going to talk a little bit more about judicial accountability. I'm then going to talk more about how we formulate constitutional identities, and finally, a little bit more about the idea of separation of powers. And in fact, that not giving the courts the ability to have a check and a meaningful way of stopping the government from doing things is precisely not giving them the ability to, you know, separate powers. But before I do that, three extraneous points of rebuttal. One, this idea of the Chilean constitution. A, it's clearly not a burden on us to defend all bad constitutions. You know, we think they are bad and we think that sometimes governments do stupid things. But also B, we think on our side now, so we're actually more likely to be able to overwhelm bad constitutions at the point where the courts are able to stand up and say, you know, these constitutions are bad. And frankly, when, or alternatively, the courts are defending these bad constitutions, the people are more likely to backlash against the courts in the way I'm going to talk about in terms of judicial accountability. Two, in terms of not passing unpopular legislation. A, what Andy tells you is that there are short-termist fluctuations that lead governments to have incentives to pass short-termist legislations because the people are on side and the government therefore respond to these uh, public backlashes, such as post 9-11. The American government wanted incredibly restrictive and incredibly invasive intrusions into privacy. The Supreme Court said no. They had to go back to the drawing board. Now the biggest issue that looks to be the issue that's going to dominate the next 20 to 30 years in American <coughs> politics is privacy. The courts prevented the government having more power but the people didn't want the government to have in the long run. We think that's good. But also B, what Andy also tells you, is that a lot of legislation is actually inaccessible to the public, but nevertheless grants the government meaningful powers that, uh, that they have deliberately consumed that the public aren't meaningfully able to engage with because, you know, they're complicated, laws are complicated, the people don't always look into these properly. We think courts, you know, are quite good at being a check on the government doing that. Finally, this idea that, you know, corrupt governments fire courts that disagree with them. Well, I think that's probably an example of courts attempting to be a check and balance on the power of bad governments. We think that's preferable to them just saying, oh, what you're doing is really bad, and no one giving a shit. Right, first point, let's talk about judicial accountability. So, we've got this concession and this agreement that judges are impeachable, but are hard to hold to account. This, they are less, on our side of the house, they are less vulnerable to popularism and they are less vulnerable to fluctuating public opinion. I.e., the idea that, you know, public opinion massively fluctuates in the ways that Andy describes based on certain issues and that courts are able to ignore these fluctuations. But also, we tell you, that they are less vulnerable to small groups that have high levels of political capital, high levels of political prioritisation, because they are more likely to vote on these issues than others. We give you the Defence of Marriage Act, right? <coughs> It was a minority in America, but with a high stake in this, who are likely to vote on this, while the majority that oppose it are unlikely to vote on it as, you know, their deciding issue, that led to politicians being incentivized to pass the Defense of Marriage Act and to push it forward. What we saw, however, is that politicians had little to gain from opposing this because very few people were likely to vote with them based on that. What, uh, what we tell you, though, is that courts stood up for the people's long-term interests, and they actually stood up for the majority here, rather than this minority with short-term, with, with large amounts of political interest in this. The defence of freedoms is important. We get it on our side of the house. What Andy also tells you is about the marital rape exemption in the UK. The idea that 
A small number of people in the UK wanted to be able to continue doing this. It was a bad idea, but the majority weren't going to vote against it. The courts made this difference. So why do we think it's important that impeachment is difficult? Because then you need to get the public on side. You need to sell to them this idea that the courts are repeatedly doing things that are against their interests. This is hard to do because you have to be able to prove it over a longer term period, which is something that is, we precisely brought to open in government and they haven't engaged with. Not being able to sell to the public Click, that these courts are doing bad things and preventing them from having what they want in the long run means that courts are actually more able to protect their freedoms in the long run. We think that's good on our side of the house. Um, second point, let's talk about constitutional identity. So what we say is that constitutions are largely formulated in broad principles and broad ideas. Note the Second Amendment in America, which is the one they like to rely on. There are many different ways that you can possibly interpret the you know, idea that you should be able to carry weapons as part of a well-regulated militia. Notice, though, that the way in which it's interpre interpreted in a popular way is because this is what the people want. They like the idea of having guns, they have a lot of political capital in doing so. This is why it's interpreted in this way by the courts, because it's more popular than otherwise. So when the DPM tells you that there are lots of different identities and interpretations of constitutional things, yeah? This is why we think it's important that courts go broad, rather than stick to individual, precise ideas that have pati p particular political capital at any specific moment. I'll take a point of information. Yeah? So necessarily, a judicial elite is likely to be separate from the majority of the people. Do you think that means that they will have different values and will therefore interpret the Constitution in ways which aren't in the interests and aren't in the desires of people well, that's just a blind assertion that everyone has the same ideas and identities. They clearly don't. So what we actually think you get is a judicial elite that, yes, is somewhat elite, but also is, uh, it tends to be made up of, of a number of people with different political identities, which means they go broad. They tend not to make short-termist decisions. They tend to be less vulnerable to these fluctuations and ideals. When they then tell you the, uh, what, what they want is to get rid of legitimacy debates in favour of just debates and ideas. A. We can have both on our side of the house. We do still get debates about whether things are good ideas. But also B. We tell you that the two are necessarily intertwined. Because what it means is we get these long discussions about what it means to be American, or what it means to be Chilean, or whatever example you want to go to. Which means that, the, uh, which means that you discuss whether the effects of the law are not just in the short term, what seems to make sense, but in the long term, what seems to fit with the principles that most of the people in the country agree with. Finally, let's talk about separation of power. So we think it is important that there are checks and balances. We think government have conceded this, and then they tell you that they want to neuter the main way that courts are effectively a check and balance on the ability of governments to do things. Because at the point when all courts can do is say, we think this law is bad and against the constitution, governments can A, go, we don't really give a shit, it's popular and we're going to go with it, and you know, there is literally no incentive on the other side not to do it for the reasons I've demonstrated, but also B, they can dismiss the courts as, you know, being uh, against the will of the people, and they can dismiss the courts as being this elite that open government want to talk about. This is why closing government's point of information that Andy makes no sense. This is why the government case in this debate hasn't won the debate. This is why we tell you that courts are more able to protect the people in the long run. This is why it's necessary to have checks and balances on the power of the legislative and prevent the majority, or indeed politically powerful minorities, from being able to tyrannise the rest of society. I'm exceptionally proud to oppose this debate. <laughs> to assume that progressive change is everywhere and always a good thing. In my first point, I'm going to give you a defence of representation, which was a word checked in opening government, but never really explained. I'm going to explain exactly why that means the only legitimate decisions we should accept as a populist are those that come from the people. Secondly, though, I'm going to talk about progressive change. I'm going to contend that it's something the courts actually promote, but then I'm going to grant that and say, even if it is, it, we would get more of it, and it would be more stable, and it would be better implemented on our side of the house yeah, uh, if, we, if you stood with the proposition. Before that, some points of rebuttal. The leader of the opposition's case 
is that there exists some kind of Rousseauian general will of the American people that exists separate from what American people actually think. We reject this. We reject the idea that there are values that people have as an abstract that cannot be traded off against people's actual preferences in the present. He says sometimes events happen that make people change their preferences. Great, then the law should change to reflect the change in preferences. And if that is something that they then come to regret, the law can be revoked or voted away later in, in view of what people think. If you are genuinely scared about a threat of terrorism or a security risk, it is illegitimate for you to trade off some privacy for extra, secur uh, extra security, regardless of whatever Jefferson may have said. That represents an entirely legitimate uh, value judgment for you to make in that, in that case. But moreover, on the examples he brought up, we point out the Patriot Act did its job for about five years before it got revoked. The government got exactly what they wanted out of that bit of legislation. Courts were ineffective. Secondly, the entire NSA thing is rubber stamped by a rubber stamped court, making it entirely legal. So it doesn't even act in order to the way he says that it does. Then say pressure groups can sometimes make governments do things against the will of the people. Firstly, we're going to tell you why that will happen much less on our side of the house when people cease to rely on courts and have to make their case in public. But further, we'd say strength of preferences reflected by lobbying is something that can be democratically legitimate. That can be something that matters in these cases. Let's move on and let's talk about legitimacy. Let's explain what representation is. Obviously, the Constitution was not written by a representative faction of the people, and obviously courts do not consist of a representative sample of the people. Why is that problematic? Because democracy exists to solve problems of incommensurate value. Some people value equality, some people value liberty, some are left, some are right, and these are things that are valued, simply values that they hold and things that they consider a priori importance to them. The problem is then, what we have with democracy is when we come together and we decide what the values of us as a state will be that will maximise, if not everybody's preference satisfaction, the preference satisfaction of as many people as possible on these incommensurate values. But for that to be legitimate, for that to be binding on people who voted the other way, who didn't want the outcome that we got, that ha they have to be represented in that process. They have to have the chance to make a say as they do when they vote as individuals for their democratic representatives. SCOTUS does not have that. It has Ginsburg, but Ginsburg is a woman. She is not the representative of all women. Uh, it has Clarence Thomas, but Clarence Thomas is not a representative of all African Americans. He's just one man. Individuals need to represent themselves as individuals. And in order to do that, they need to express these decisions through legislature when they vote and not have them struck down by unrepresentative courts. But even if, even if you exist, uh, accept their characterization of just great impartial judges, shut up, striking down, legisla uh, striking down this legislation in accordance with the general will of the American population was a good thing, that's not the reality. The trade-off in this debate is not a democracy versus absolute judges. It's good democracy versus weird, unaccountable horse trading in back rooms. Because you, you know that we get partial appointments of Supreme Court judges. We know that, they, that what matters is when they happen to die under a left-wing or a right-wing president. The rights that people have should not be dependent on those morally arbitrary facts. And neither should they depend on how much pork barreling we can get into an appropriations bill so that that blue dog Democrat will just happen to vote the right way. That's not absolute moral values, as opening opposition wanted to tell you. That's just unrepresentative and bad. Let's talk about progressive change. First of all, we contend that the majority of the decisions courts do are progressive. Look at the Hobby Lobby case, insisting that women did not have to live up to what the legislation said, uh, employers did not have to live up to what the legislation said, and ensure contraceptive health for female employees. Look at gun crime as we've given you. <coughs> Secondly, we reject the progressive legislation it is in and of itself a good thing. See the principled case I just brought you. We say it is more just and representative in those cases. <coughs> in those cases. But let's accept, right, let's accept that the majority of decisions courts make are, are progressive and that progressivism is a good thing. Why do we still win on our side of the house? For three reasons. Firstly, because there's an enormous backlash to what is perceived as judicial activism in the outcome of uh, <coughs> progressive legislation. People feel as though a minority is celebrating the fact that the, the, uh, a court that is not representative, as I explained, has voted against what 60 or 70 percent of the people in that state think. That transforms that minority to being a special interest group, demanding extra rights, demanding special, <coughs> demanding special treatment. What are the, res the results of this? Firstly, 
far harder to get more progressive legislation in the long term because those issues become politically toxic. You're siding with the anti-democratic majority. You're siding with the special interest group and the people who are demanding special treatment. That becomes very difficult for politicians to stand with the long term, Michael. How, without Roe versus Wade, would it ever have been possible to get access to abortions for women in the South? Uh, with a p appropriate piece of legislation. The second thing to say is Roe versus Wade, I mean, the second thing to say is Roe versus Wade, I don't think is legislation out of the court case. The third thing to say is that uh, Roe versus Wade is a crap bit of legislation for protecting the rights to abortion in America. It does not represent your, uh, protect your access to abortion. So politicians can just shut down all the abortion clinics they like. That's why they've shut down a dozen of them in Texas, because it's not seen as something that people want, but something that's foisted upon them by a judicial elite. That means it's pretty much impossible to get an abortion in Texas because your right to represent, uh, access it is not protected. Better to have a bit of democratically passed legislation that would protect your access as well as your formal right. The second thing to say is that, my, uh, going back to my case, is that minorities face more discrimination on a day-to-day -day basis when you, they are seen as their rights coming from judicial activism and not the support of the people around them. At that point, they do face discrimination as being part of that group on the street every single day. The second thing we say on this is that we change the lobbying tactics of social movements but would otherwise try and make that place in the general public. The first reason for, for that is people see these issues as wrapped up in arcane legal language. It's not about right and wrong. It's about their exact placement of commas in a, in a clause. That alienates people from getting involved in that discussion and coming out and just backing a bit of liberal legislation just because it's the right thing to do. But we also, on our side of the house, frighten more donors and frighten an apathetic majority of people into supporting those cases where they otherwise wouldn't because they can't rely on courts to save them. Mr Speaker, the only legitimate decisions are those made by the people. But even if that's not true, we get more of the outcomes they like on our side of the house with pride. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hitherto, this debate has focused on which side the state makes better decisions. What we're going to explain to you is how for devolved and federalised states, where supreme and constitutional courts are most powerful, the court's power in this instance is necessary for the very survival of that state. Because when different areas have different legislative capabilities and the ability to pass legislation that threatens the union, someone has to stand in their way and be able to bridge the political cost of being someone who is reaching in and saying, you can't have these states' rights to stop that happening. Three things, two things in this speech. Three things in this speech. First off, direct response to closing government. Secondly, why this is necessary to make federalism viable. And finally, democratic legitimacy, that chat. So, first off, responses. They spoke about two things, representation and backlash. Let's talk about each. On representation, they say it's necessary for, these sorts of, for, democratic, for decisions made by governments to come from the people. This is interesting, firstly, given that they say they're happy with lobbying. Right? I don't understand how me giving money to a congressman, right, or me giving access to a congressman, or me letting, me letting him in to the revolving door of the pharmaceutical industry, right, is necessarily coming directly from the people. So that was a bizarre principle concession for them to make. But the second and more important thing is that it is a myth to say that a decision coming from the people means 50% plus one agreeing with it, right? Something being, something being in accordance with the preferences of people needs to take into account the intensity of that preference. Because me sort of saying, hey, I find gay people a bit icky, so I'm going to vote against gay marriage, which I wouldn't say incidentally, is very different from a gay person saying, this actually inhibits my capacity to feel like a real human being in this state. The latter preference is distinctly more valuable because it is much deeply held. It is a much greater reflection of the restriction that the state is imposing upon that individual's agency. Because we recognise the fact that democracy is important, but we tell you why. It's a basic reciprocity. It's because the state exercises huge coercive power over individuals, and that in response, those individuals ought to get some say over how that coercive power is used. 
Thus, if a piece of legislation is more coercive on me, it is sensible that I should get more say. Now, of course, we don't like to have this officially encoded directly in the system where everyone's saying I have like coercive power 10 on this policy, right? So I get 10 votes, right? Because that would be ridiculous. But we do sometimes impose certain limits on the extent to which a qualified majority can have a say. Because we recognise the fact that some things affect some people incredibly deeply. That's why we have things like local voting, for instance, certain local issues that affect local people the most. This is a principle we already recognise. The third thing they say is Clarence Thomas and Ruth Bader Ginsburg don't represent all of their groups. Good, that's not what they're supposed to do. They're there to pass, to like see how consistent legislation is with the constitution that people have voted on and can amend if they want to. They're not there to represent groups, they're there to interpret law. Big difference. The second thing they say is, aha, well you get less progressive change on your side of the house. The first argument they make here is black, uh, is, is back. So they say, look, Roe versus Wade, which is a court decision, not a piece of legislation, Ben, right, is like a terrible thing because it, it increased opposition to abortion. Two things to say here. The first thing is you get no change in some places, right, because Alabama is never going to vote locally to allow people to have access to abortions. So the only way this is going to happen is if it's imposed from on high. But the federal legislature is never going to do it because they are vulnerable to exactly the sorts of arguments of federal overreach that you were talking about. So the only way we get change in Alabama is if this happens, right? But the second thing to say here is yes, there is some political backlash. The first thing is that if Washington were doing a change electorally, there would still be that political backlash, right? Obama is still seeing as imposing Obamacare on states in spite of the fact that he's elected and not a course official. But the second thing to say here, more importantly, is look, we are happy to trade off some access to abortion in areas where there would otherwise be none in exchange for fine tuning of the abortion rights more generally because of the loss of political capital for the abortion lobby. We don't think that trade-off really happens, but we think there's still an anti-federal backlash when the government does it, but insofar as it does, that's a trade-off we're happy to make. The second thing they say is we get more discussion on our side of the House. No, because the issue wouldn't even be raised on your side of the House, because you know that Alabamans are never going to allow you to impose this legislation upon them. So that was misdirected. Why does this make federalism viable, right? Recognise the fact that constitutional courts are most active in federal states, like for instance the United States, Germany, or South Africa. And the reason for that is that federal states are federal because they impose such a diverse range of preferences, histories, economic interests, etc., 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 which means that different localities are going to want radically different policies in terms of the values they espouse, in terms of the interests that they promote. And someone needs to stand up and say, actually, no, you have to reconcile these to lead to some degree of consistency of values and some degree of consistency of interests so that we can continue to survive as a state. What do I mean by this? One, in terms of consistency of interest, things like stuff that restricts interstate commerce, for instance, stuff that imposes tariffs on goods from different states, it's obviously necessary to prevent states from doing this to ensure they all meet a common economic interest. But secondly, and more importantly, to preserve some degree of consistency of values. Because when there is a state within your union that takes groups that you care about or values that you believe in and massively constrains them, it's very difficult to exist in a politically cohesive unit when that happens. When these people take people whom you know and people whose agency you value and constrain their rights by saying, you cannot marry who you want, you cannot sleep with who you want, we're going to throw you in jail for simply being who you are, it is impossible to exist in a political union with those people because you fear them, because you feel they are a threat to things and people whom you value. The results of this are twofold. One, some degree of political violence in some cases, CF the US Civil War. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, right, just limited political cooperation. Because when people use the coercive power of their local legislature to restrain violence that you really care about and to harm people you really care about, it is impossible to cooperate with them and form a politically cohesive unit. Now, of course, on your side of the house, you would have the federal government in Enforcing these sorts of policies. But crucially, the federal government would never enforce these sorts of policies because of exactly the sort of anti federal, anti big government, anti Washington backlash that you talk about. They would never have an incentive to say, sorry, Alabama, you can't do this to gay people because they would be accused of being anti states' rights. Whereas the Supreme Court can do that because it doesn't face that immediate political response. And it's incredibly important that you have the political leeway to enforce these sorts of decisions. So this is necessary for the survival of the federal state and the maintenance of values that allow for the basic level of political cooperation and prevent violence, political or physical kit. Look, do you think it's going to be perceived as more legitimate if your state's rights are curtailed by a tiny judicial elite, or if they are curtailed by some yeah. like, democratic... I think we were saying, flat out, your state's rights need to be curtailed if you're locking people up in their seat. Right? The problem is, the political elite is never going to do it in the first place because they face the immediate political consequences and pressure of that. The Supreme Court is the only person who has the leeway to do that. We're happy to take that trade-off in those instances, right? Moreover, we think the difference is going to be marginal. CF again, how much people hate Obama for Obamacare. Now, these guys talk about democratic legitimacy. We think democratic legitimacy is important to some extent, and that's what these sorts of policies actually do. They preserve democratic legitimacy by saying there is a higher bar for which you need to reach to infringe upon certain things, right? We're not saying you can never, like, ban guns in the US, we're simply saying you have to get a super majority to change the constitution in order to do so, right? So the question then becomes, are the rights the constitution safeguard by imposing a higher bar, good ones normatively, or bad ones normatively? 
a couple of things to say here. The first is we're going to normative good ones because the principle of constitution forming is we will enshrine as little as possible by and large. That was the principle James Madison had. Now, yes, he included some bizarre stuff like some ramification of the interstate commerce clause and the Second Amendment, but by and large, we think they're usually pretty sound. But moreover, we think the US Constitution is a particularly pathological example because by and large, they have evolved since 1776, Mr. Speaker. The final thing they say is, well, what about Chile? One, Michelle Bachelet is changing it, but secondly, after big transitions of power, the Constitution normally gets rewritten, so that was misdirected. Look, at the end of this debate, this power is necessary for the preservation of the state. If they're concerned about the state making good decisions, surely its preservation is a necessary precondition. I'm very proud of your pose. You see, what I don't understand about the last case is why it is that judges have special access to some objective information that allows them to keep the union together. Because locking up people for who they sleep with is a massive overstatement of the difference in, the, in this debate between legislatures and courts. Firstly, but when it overstates that difference in value, it misses the point about the way the, the, the diversity that exists within legislatures that allows them to capture those disagreements and make people feel more part of that state by recognising those disagreements within them. Sometimes, accepting that there's slightly less coherence is actually a way to make overall units more coherent, and you miss that. But moreover, if there is such a big gap in this debate between what the people think and what your special like um, elitist judges think, and it clearly is the case that you are denying democratic rights in this debate. And Ben's extension then becomes bang, bang into this debate. So, I want to do three things. Firstly, I want to deal with what we've heard from the last speaker. Secondly, I want to talk about the illegitimacy of courts. Thirdly, I want to talk about why legislators tend to be better sites tend to be better sites of democratic debate in these cases on a pragmatic level, and thirdly, why if we accept the opposition case that progressive legislation is better, why we improve and empower progressive causes and advocacy. So, the necessity for federalism of the current system. Look, it just isn't the case that the union is going to fall apart in this case. That is a ridiculous thing to run in this case. Why is it the case that, that basically our case, right, essentially directly rebuts that, and we tell you large numbers of reasons why people feel more empowered when courts accept that people disagree with impolities, or people have different views, whereas when courts force a singular judgment upon people which says, this is the right answer, that is far more alienating than recognising disagreement. The second thing here Michael brings us is about democracy. He says, well, firstly, we just conceded the case when we said about lobbying. But the point is, everyone can lobby, although there may be some like financial differences. Everyone, in theory, can uh, lobby. Whereas on your side, not everyone can be Justice Kennedy. That's the problem for you guys. <laughs> Secondly, they say, ah, but strength preferences are a problem for us. They're not. Democracy is exactly the body, and literature is exactly the body that reflects those strength preferences, because you can reflect it how, like, the extent to which you turn out for those votes. And if you don't care, uh, that wouldn't happen. Ready? Whereas courts fail to, to get that. Finally, the thing Michael tries to say towards our case is, well, we're just going to get a massive backlash. Look, we would rather that backlash, to the extent it does exist, is anti-government rather than anti-minority as it is on your side, because those are the people that you would regard as being blameworthy. So, why do we think courts will illegitimate in these, in these scenarios um, in terms of annulling legislation? Opening government, no thanks, told us our constitutions were old. Ben gave you four additional reasons for why courts were illegitimate. Firstly, he told you they were often elitist, they were out of touch, white, rich, um, men weren't often the most progressive people. He gave examples of gun control, other Wendell Holmes restricting things like freedom of speech. Third, secondly, Ben talked Freddy. about the fact, no thanks, that courts are less, less diverse in terms of the opinions that they're capable of reflecting. It's just a fast opening opposition in this debate just to claim that these courts are always incredibly progressive. But moreover, even the most diverse court could never capture the full range of diversity in a polity, right? Even if you had like, these, these different candidates, the most they were going to be representative of big chunks of groups. Like Hispanic group or African Americans. You could never capture all the different range in that full spectrum. But you're far more likely to do when you have 600 people in the legislature arguing from all different types of opinion. Moreover, Ben tells you it's important that people can express those mandates as individuals. No response again. Fourthly, so thirdly, 
think Ben told you, is that this process of, co of, of courts and early legislation ignores the incommensurability of value. Because when you enforce a singular verdict upon people, rather than capturing that disagreement, again, you violate democratic rights. Moreover, we say that's actually a more coherent thing to do, to accept that those disagreements exist. We think that makes people feel more included. Finally, if Ben tells you, this is a violation of the democratic principle of consent. And no opt-in has ever wanted to respond to that in debate, yes. other than by saying, we disagree with the type of legislation that some, sometimes gets passed. Look, right. they say, actually, people really like freedom, we promise, we really think. Look, well, maybe they didn't at those points, and maybe, and we told you why that was legitimate, and you didn't respond. Simply not agreeing with regressive legislation or legislation that restricts certain types of activity is not a reason right. not to do it when it violates democratic consent. So why then the legislature's better sites of democratic debate on a pragmatic level. Firstly, as Ben tells you, they're more, less likely to use the kind of abstruse, patronising and alienating language that puts people off politics altogether and off those, off those issues. Judgments are rubbish at persuading ordinary voters. Who, like, it's completely unintelligible to me as someone who's studying at university. For the vast majority of people, these things, these things right. do put them off those issues. Secondly, we say, we think that actually legislatures are um, legislatures are better because they are more capable of focusing on the issue itself rather than get distracting by certain other concerns. So rather than Roe versus Wade being transformed into um, a debate about abortion, it became a federal versus state issue, as Ben tells you, and that's uh, in many ways more problematic. So, um, closing. As I told you, this, this just imposes a higher bar, namely that of constitutional amendments, on certain changes that likely this a particularly strong dispreference from certain minorities will change the nature of the system. How is that undemocratic? Should it just reflect the intensity of some of people's preferences? But Michael, you have to justify why that bar should exist. If people think something and they've expressed preferences, you need to justify to me why we should place obstacles to the realisation of those preferences, given that you think that those preferences are legitimate to some extent. Or you're, like, it's just not reasonable for you to make voice that burden upon us in this debate, given that we've given multiple reasons why the opposite would be the case. So, why do we improve progressive causes? Okay. Opening opposition tell us this matters in the debate. So, Ben tells you that we encourage progressive advocacy where they're not simply um, pressured to look to the courts to deal with, it, with these issues, because they often currently are okay. pressured to look to courts because they see them as an easy option. Now we require them to go out and persuade people, to canvas voters, to use the tools that they have to persuade people of these issues. We think that's a much more sustainable way to create progressive change. Look, look legal rights mean very little unless they're supported by a popular consensus, as Ben tells you. And the only way you're ultimately going to have that and ensure that people don't want to repeal that legislation in future years through legislation is when people buy into that legislation when they've been convinced on their doorstep that those things are worthwhile. Which means that LGBT groups are more likely um, to go out and actually try and persuade voters. Moreover, it's just like, unreasonable in this debate for them to claim that somehow um, legislatures are always power hungry and oligopolistic. Look, have you seen the Tea Party? That it, it clearly is the case that legislatures are, um, are cyclical and that they are self-corrective. So if government does overreach, people are always likely to respond to that. They're not stupid in these cases. They can realise what their preferences are and realise that potentially they traded too much security in that case and realise that that wasn't something that was something they wanted to change. Look, in this debate, they never told us why people shouldn't get to decide what issues that matter to them when there weren't simple answers that could be decided by out-of-touch people. For these reasons, we propose. told us that they thought it was really bad that Rowan Wade is not perfect and state legislatures are able to get around the abortion laws by um, imposing other restrictions. But what, they, what their side would never, they never showed us how they would get their really awesome legislation which would impose this upon every state. Because in order to just say we would prefer legislation to a court case, they needed to show that that legislation would actually occur. And that was the missing link in their case. When, 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 when politicians are unwilling to pass legislation, we at least allow the courts to step in and do so, and that's particularly important when certain laws are important for the functioning of a federal system. Two points in this speech. First, what leads to, the more, to more legitimate decisions? And secondly, how does this prefer, preserve federal... Um, federal systems within states. First, what leads to more legitimate decisions? 
So we heard in the last speech, not everyone is just as Kennedy. Well, yes, guys, not everyone is just as Kennedy. But it's also true that not everyone is Obama. You needed to show us why it was that the ability to lobby politicians was so much more accessible than the ability to have an organisation give you pro bono legal funding and support you in taking your court case, as many civil rights organisations in the United States do. And that has been important to passing cases like Windsor. The fact that the gay rights, that gay rights organisations have funded a given legal aid to allow those sorts of decisions to be made. They never showed us why it was that that was any less accessible than someone being able to take all of the lobbying dollar and go and approach a congressman and try and persuade them round to their point of view. They told us that judges are really elite and won't be able to make decisions on the basis of what people actually want. This was, uh, this was bizarre, seeing as we've usually seen judges be more progressive. The fact that Roe and Wade was passed before the majority of American people supported abortion would be a primary example. But it was also bizarre because it seemed to be at tension with what their opening team said. They told us that these judges would still have plenty of power because they'd still be able to say that bad legislation is inconsistent with the Constitution. The difference is, they want that power to exist, but they make the courts a, a, a quango who basically exists in an advisory capacity for the government, whereas we give them real power by actually giving them something they can do about government, overstepping the line and acting beyond their powers. We think that's better, because it's much. we want to create a high bar in order to ensure that you're able to infringe on minority rights. Because it is important that you're not able to disenfranchise one particular group of people now. So if they want to talk about voting, it's important that we're able to stop things like voter registration laws that disproportionately affect black people and ultimately affect the voting that happens down the line. It's important that we preserve the state in the first place and allow decisions to be made within some sort of common framework. We never heard any um, proper response to our point about how people's preferences are often extremely intense on particular issues and it's important you weight those. So we, the issues where people's preferences are particularly important are where there are minority group who are being infringed on by a majority who care somewhat but not really about that issue. We allow courts to weight that and reflect that in the decisions they make. They don't provide that capacity and that's why that's better. They told us that there was um, backlash to Roe and Wade. And yes, there was. The difference is you would never have been able to get the legislation in the Mid-South West in the first place. You would never be able to get all of the change they want. So even though there are imperfections in the law, like the fact that you're able to force people to have ultrasound tests before they're able to have their abortion, we still have that um, existing there and people are still able to access that as a service. That's why we're better on our side. Now let's look at how this preserves federal system, something we thought was hugely important for this debate and was uh, responded to very flippantly by Freddie. He said, oh, but it's not as if the entire government is going to collapse as a result of this. Well, maybe not, but maybe it will in some cases. But we told, what we told you was that it is important for the functioning of a federal system in an efficient manner that you are able to have laws and frameworks passed on a national level. So in Germany, it's important that Baden-Württemberg isn't able to, pa to pass a law stating that it won't recognise the marriage of certain people in Bavaria, because it's important that within a common state, there are common frameworks, so people are able to trade, commerce, and have their relationships as normal. Furthermore, it's probably important that you have a common system of gun, of gun regulation in a country where you have free and open immigration. So that's why it's important that we have the ability to impose things upon by a federal level. They never showed us why you were able to do this through legislation. What we told you is that the cost is so much greater when a politician has to take the hit by infringing upon a state's rights. A court is so much more able to do that, and that's why it's important for the functioning of a federal democracy. Okay. The US Supreme Court also strikes down federal legislation that violates states' rights. Doesn't that mean the federal government will sometimes ignore backlash, i.e. with Obamacare, but that Supreme Court block them from being able to do that? So, yeah, in some cases the federal government might um, restrict the ability of um, certain states to be able to do things, but, what we, uh, but it's far more important that you're able to ensure the broad general functioning on a national level of the sorts of systems that are necessary. It's important you have a common framework for interstate commerce, it's important you have a common system for the way marriage is registered within nations, and that's why it's far better, because we think it is unlikely that Obama is going to want to, be to take the hit of going and telling southern states that he's imposing abortion legislation 
on them from above. It's far easier to do that when you're a court and you're removed, removed from the immediate political ramifications of that decision. So you're able to get the sorts of frameworks that are necessary for federal systems to exist. They're not able to do that. Why is this so important? It's, it's important that states aren't able to act in a way that disadvantages other states because in a federal system it's important that the country acts as a somewhat cohesive unit in terms of being able to move forward, create laws and negotiate with other countries and have a common internal framework for how it sets up its market and sets up its laws in general. This is crucial because it is necessary for um, relationships to persist within that state and it's necessary um, for that state to be able to make general decisions about all of the things that uh, that country deals with. So it's, that's why it's so important that we have the frameworks necessary for the state to continue to exist on a national level and represent the interests of everyone. We don't believe that one state should simply be able to screw another state over by passing laws on tariffs. What they do, they have no mechanism for dealing with this because it's easy for a state government based on populism to turn around and ignore the advice of the quango they've created. We give them real power, it's just the rules of federalism.